All right, Ninja Nerds, in this video today, we are going to talk about the thalamus. We're going to get into tons of detail on all the various nuclei, their overall functions. I just want to give a big shout out because this video that we're going to do on the thalamus today is because of one of our Ninja Nerds, AIM. So because AIM is one of our master Ninja Nerd kind of level members, he requested that we make this video on the thalamus. And you guys can also do that too. If you guys go down in our actual description box, we'll have links to our YouTube page where you guys can sign up, become members. If you guys want to request some specific videos, we have different levels that you guys can join and uh, we can try to connect with you. All right, so let's go ahead and get started on the actual thalamus. All right, so let's get started on the thalamus. Now the thalamus is actually, you know, when you're learning about it, it can be quite daunting, especially when you look in the books and they got like these millions of nuclei. You're just like, what the crap is going on? So what I really want to do is, is I want to talk about all these thalamic nuclei and their functions, but I think the best way to learn them is to separate them based upon what kind of information they're acting as a relay station for. Because that's the basic thing. If you guys don't remember anything out of this video, I want you to take away that the thalamus is a relay station. Basic function is it's a relay station for three types of information. One, limbic system information. Two, sensory information. Three, motor information. It's taking that information and sending it to the cerebral cortex. That's the basic outline of this video. But now what we gotta do is, is really dig into the types of limbic information, types of sensory, and types of motor information that the thalamus is acting as a relay station for. All right, let's start with the first couple thalamic nuclei. There's three particular thalamic nuclei that are involved in the limbic information that it's a relay station for. So let's go ahead and talk about the first one. The first nucleus that I want to discuss here is very cool. I really like this one. It's called the anterior thalamic nuclei. Let's kind of show you where that is, okay? So if you look over here, we have a little diagram here. Okay. This is a thalamus. This is kind of the view of the thalamus. It's an egg-shaped structure, and it's divided into three different kind of nuclear groups by this little Y-shaped structure. This Y-shaped structure is actually called the internal or medial medullary lamina. So what is it called? It's referred to as the internal medullary lamina. Or again, sometimes it can be referred to as the medial medullary lamina. What the nice thing about this little internal medullary lamina is, is that first thing, it's actually a white matter structure. Okay, so it's myelinated axons. The second thing that's really cool is it separates the thalamus into three different nuclear groups. The first nuclear group we're going to talk about here is called the anterior nuclear group. That's the first one that we're going to focus on. The other nuclei that are actually important to the limbic structures of the thalamus is going to be another one. So if you look here, we kind of have a little directional kind of anatomy here, right? So this is the anterior portion of the thalamus, posterior portion of the thalamus, lateral portion of the thalamus, and the medial portion. On the medial side, okay, right in here, you have a specific nucleus that we're going to discuss next after the anterior thalamic nucleus. And this is called the medial dorsal nucleus. So this is called our medial dorsal nucleus, or sometimes referred to as dorsal medial nucleus. The last nucleus that I want to talk about here is actually kind of lodged within the internal medullary lamina. So all of these little dots in here are called your intralaminar nuclei, right? So they're little gray matter structures that are kind of dispersed through this internal medullary lamina. There's one particular intralaminar nuclei that we really want to focus on here because it's involved with limbic system information. And this one here is called your centromedian nucleus. Centromedian nucleus. Okay, so there's three particular nuclei that we're going to focus on here, on the limbic nuclei of the thalamus. The anterior thalamic nucleus, the medial dorsal nucleus, or sometimes referred to as the dorsal medial nucleus, and a type of intralaminar nucleus, which is called the centromedian nucleus. Let's start discussing the anterior thalamic nucleus. So the basic thing I want you to remember with the anterior thalamic nucleus is that this is involved in particularly a spe special type of circuit that we're going to discuss here. And this circuit is called Pape's circuit. Okay, it's called Pape's circuit. And Pape's circuit is important because this, this circuit is involved in what's called episodic memory. 
but particularly the emotional involvement of episodic memory. So it's involved in emotional, emotional, episodic memory. This is very, very important. You want to know why? We're going to talk about the circuit, but if there is damage to the Pape circuit and you have loss of this emotional episodic memory, there's particular diseases that can be affected within this Pape circuit. You know, you know what kind of diseases can actually uh, manifest whenever there's damage to the Pape circuit? It can be diseases like Alzheimer's because we already know that Alzheimer's disease is basically a disease of one of the, the memory aspect. Okay. The other one is Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's disease is also another one that can be affected. Okay. And the other one that's actually very interesting is called Korsakoff syndrome. Okay. So Korsakoff syndrome, the Korsakoff syndrome is actually due to usually an alcoholics Korsakoff syndrome. And this is usually due to a thymine deficiency. So what I want you to know is that the anterior thalamic nuclei is involved in the emotional episodic memory via the circuit called the Pape circuit. Whenever there is damage of this circuit, there's loss of episodic memory in conditions such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and Korsakoff syndrome. Let's dig into this Pape circuit. If you look here, we have a sagittal section of the brain, right? And then we got these little things hanging off here. That's our pituitary gland. And then we have this other structure here called the mammillary bodies. If we look in here, we got a couple structures here that I want to define first. Obviously, this right here is our thalamus. And the nuclei that we really want to focus on is right here, that anterior thalamic nuclei. This structure here is called the corpus callosum. So this is called our corpus callosum. It's a commissural fiber. It connects both sides of the cerebral hemisphere, right? There's another structure above that, just above that. And this is called the cingulate gyrus. So this is called the cingulate gyrus. And then, so we have our thalamus, we have our corpus callosum, we have our cingulate gyrus. Then you have this green structure here. This green structure is very, very important. This green structure is called our hippocampus. The hippocampus is a very important structure involved with our memory. There's another structure underneath that we'll talk about in, this, in a second, but it's called the entorhinal cortex, the entorhinal cortex, but we'll talk about that in just a second. What happens is the hippocampus is involved with memory storage. There's a structure that takes information from the hippocampus. And what it does is it takes that information, the memory information from the hippocampus, moves upwards past the corpus callosum, and then comes over here in synapses on the structures here of the mammillary bodies. These are your mammillary bodies. What happens is these neurons in the mammillary bodies, then once they're stimulated from the, what's this, what's this orange structure called? Very important structure. So this is called your fornix. This is called your fornix. So from the hippocampus, the fornix connects to the mammillary bodies, stimulates the nuclei of the mammillary bodies. Guess where the mammillary bodies go to? Whoop, boop. They send their fibers to the anterior thalamic nuclei. So here we're gonna have our anterior thalamic nuclei. What is nuclei? It's a group of cell bodies present in the central nervous system. So from these fibers, from the mammillary bodies, you stimulate the anterior thalamic nuclei. The anterior thalamic nuclei then send their axons upwards. And guess where they go? To the cingulate gyrus. The cingulate gyrus, which is another important component of the limbic system, sends its axons downwards. We're going to follow this down here. Through the cingulate gyrus all the way down here. And guess where it moves to? It comes around here and stimulates this little brown structure. What did we say that brown structure was before? We called this brown structure here the into rhinal cortex. This is a little structure that's a part of the parahippocampal gyrus. We're not going to get into tons of detail on that. But what I want you to know is that the enterorhinal cortex has little neurons that guess what it connects with? The hippocampus. What is this? It's an entire loop. It's a circuit. So I want to recap this. This is a very high yield thing. 
What is Pepe's circuit involved in emotional episodic memory? Hippocampus involved in memory sends information via the fornix to the mammillary bodies. Mammillary body sends their mammalothalamic tract to the anterior thalamic nuclei. Anterior thalamic nuclei send their information to the cingulate gyrus. Cingulate gyrus sends its information down to the entorhinal cortex. And the entorhinal cortex, particularly what's called the perforant pathway, sends its information and finishes the circuit in the hippocampus. The whole purpose of the circuit is emotional episodic memory. Boom, roasted. We killed the anterior thalamic nuclei. Let's move on to the next one, which is the medial dorsal or dorsal medial nucleus. All right, so we talked about the anterior thalamic nuclei. The other one we got to talk about is this dorsal medial nucleus or medial dorsal nucleus. Let's just put medial dorsal nucleus. But just to remember, they are interchangeable. Okay? So, medial dorsal nucleus or dorsal medial nucleus. If you look at it, where its position is here, we already talked about the anterior thalamic nucleus. We already discussed that one above. This is the medial side. This is the lateral side of the thalamus. So where would you find it? You would find it right here. That's our medial dorsal nucleus. The medial dorsal nucleus is another imp uh, important component of the limbic system, but a particular aspect of it. So what we really need to know is three important things. This is obviously involved with emotions. It's involved with your emotions, particularly obviously at the emotional aspect of memory. It's involved in motivation. And it's involved in your overall drive, okay? So I want you to remember here, let's actually be specific here, not just emotions itself, but emotional memory. So it's involved in emotional memory, motivation, and drive. Whenever there is damage to the dorsal medial nucleus or the medial dorsal nucleus, it can affect our emotional aspect of memory. It can affect motivation. It can affect our drive and lead to a lot of personality changes. You know what kind of disease actually loves to affect this area of the thalamus? We already talked about it above. Korsakoff syndrome. So whenever someone has a severe thymine deficiency, right? So this is a thymine deficiency, vitamin B1. Severe deficiency of thymine. This can affect not only the papase circuit, but it also can affect the dorsal median nucleus. Okay, so let's talk about some of the structures that are connected with the dorsal medial nucleus. So what you need to remember is that the dorsal medial nucleus or medial dorsal nucleus receives three particular sensory information, or three particular afferents. One, we already talked about it already. What was this structure that we talked about above? will send its information about memory, emotional aspects of memory in this case, to the dorsal median nucleus. The other structure here, you see this little uh, kind of maroon shaped structure? This is a very important one. This is called the amygdala, right? So the amygdala is also a very important component of our limbic system. It's involved with kind of fear, anxiety, aggression, a lot of that types of emotions. So it will also send its information to the dorsal medial nucleus. And then there's one other one. You know the hypothalamus? The hypothalamus has multiple different nuclei and multiple different types of functions. But it's also another limbic nuclei structure. It can send information to the dorsal medial nucleus. So there's three structures I want you to remember that send its sensory information or send its afferents, its inputs to the dorsal medial nucleus. First one is the Second one is the amygdala. And third one is the hypothalamus. Now, once the dorsal medial nucleus receives all of this input, it takes that information and sends all of this information about emotional memory, motivation, drive, fear, anxiety, aggression, all of that stuff, and sends it to a particular area of the cerebrum. You know this area of the cerebrum? Very, very important for you know, attention, for personality, for abstract thinking, as well as a lot of aspects of our emotional port component of memory. You know what this green structure is called here? This is called our prefrontal cortex. This is called our prefrontal cortex. Sweet. So again, the inputs are going to be the hypothalamus, the 
and the hypothalamus. And then the output after it receives all of this information is to the prefrontal cortex. Beautiful. That's our dorsal median nucleus or medial dorsal nucleus. Now let's talk about the last one here, which is the centromedian nucleus. All right, so the last one that I want to talk about since we talked about the anterior thalamic nucleus, the dorsal medial or medial dorsal nucleus, the last one is your centromedian nucleus. And what did I say? This was one of the intralaminar nuclei. So if I really quickly draw that structure there, right? So here's our internal medullary lamina or your uh, medial medullary lamina here, right? There's all these nuclei we talked about, the intralaminar nuclei, okay? The big one that I really want us to focus on here is called the centromedian nucleus. But just for your own edification, what are the names of another one of those intralaminar nuclei? There's two types. One, we already talked, we're going to talk about it, the centromedian nucleus. The second one is called the parafascicular nucleus. And we're not going to really focus on that one a lot, but I want us to know that there is different types of lam interlaminar nuclei. We're going to focus on centromedian, but the other one is the parafascicular nucleus. All right, so here we're going to draw that big old centromedian nucleus right here. Okay, within that internal medullary lamina. What is the job of the centromedian nucleus? Here's what I want you to know. It receives information via your slow pain pathways. So it receives information via the slow pain pathways. What are, the, what are the pain pathways? Do you remember what the name of that pathway is? That is the spinothalamic tract. And if you guys remember, which type of fibers actually carry this slow pain? Is it the C fibers or the A delta fibers? It's the C fibers, right? So this structure here, the centromedian nucleus will receive information. So here we're gonna have some type of pain stimulus. That pain stimulus is going to activate what types of fibers? C fibers. This is our C fibers. The C fibers will come into the, actually the posterior gray horn, and we know they synapse in the posterior gray horn, cross over, and then ascend upwards as a part of our spinal lemniscus. So this will actually be what's called our spinal lemniscus. Now we know that as the spinal lemniscus ascends upwards, it gives off little collaterals to the reticular formation. Some of it gives off spinal reticular fibers. But the spinal lemniscus, eventually, some of these fibers will synapse and end on that centromedian nucleus. And some of the fibers from the reticular formation may also give some information to the centromedian nucleus. Now, whenever the centromedian nucleus receives this pain pathway information, particularly slow pain pathway information, it then sends this information to nonspecific cortical areas. So it's going to send this to nonspecific. So what does that mean? It means we don't really know. It sends it to a whole bunch of different areas in the cerebral cortex. So nonspecific cortical areas. One is believed that it can actually send it to the cingulate gyrus. Why is all of this important? The centromedian nucleus, it takes pain and actually applies an emotional aspect of it. That's why we believe that one of the specific areas that it actually goes to, one of the specific areas, is called the cingulate gyrus. Now remember what I told you, the cingulate gyrus is involved in our limbic system. That's emotions. So technically, this central median nucleus is believed to be involved with the emotional aspect of pain. Boom, roasted. All right, so we've covered the main limbic thalamic nuclei, the anterior medial dorsal and the central median nucleus. Let's now move on to the sensory thalamic nuclei. All right, so let's get into detail on the sensory thalamic nuclei. All right, so let's kind of talk about some of the basic anatomy of it. We'll pick out some of those structures that we're going to talk about in this sensory thalamic nuclei portion. So again, giving the orientation of this thalamus here. This is the anterior portion of the thalamus, posterior portion of the thalamus, medial portion of the thalamus, and lateral portion. We already discussed the anterior thalamic nuclei. We already discussed the dorsal medial nucleus or the medial dorsal nucleus. And we also talked about one of the intralaminar nuclei, which is the central median nucleus. If you guys really remember, one of the other ones was the parafascicular. 
So now we kind of got a couple other structures left. All right. Here, you're going to have this whole group here. This whole group here is called your lateral nuclear group. But what we do is we split the lateral nuclear group into two components, okay? This dorsal component and this ventral component, or anterior posterior component. The first thing that we have to talk about is in this ventral, there's a bunch of different types of nuclei. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to abbreviate them, but we're going to talk about them throughout the process of this video. The first nucleus here is actually going to be most anterior in this uh, lateral nuclear group. This is called the ventro anterior nucleus. If you move a little bit kind of like lateral to that, you're going to have a ventral lateral nucleus. Move a little bit more, you're going to have what's called the ventro posterior lateral nucleus. And then you have one more, which is kind of creeping back here, which is called your ventro posterior medial nucleus. So again, four particular nuclei that are located in this lateral nuclear group but in the ventral portion it is ventral anterior ventral lateral ventral posterior lateral and ventral posterior medial the two that are going to be involved in sensory activity is the ventral posterior medial and the ventral posterior lateral the ventral lateral and the ventral anterior are your motor nuclei of the thalamus okay cool so that's two of them there this nuclei back here in this dorsal aspect of this lateral nuclear group. This thing here, this is all called your pulvinar nucleus. So what is this called? This is called your pulvinar nucleus, this whole area back here. Now, there's two other ones. <clears throat> Again, if you look at the thalamus, this is the medial side, this is the lateral side, okay? You have these two little nuclei that are kind of coming off the back of the thalamus. One's a little bit more on the medial side, one's a little bit more on the lateral side. These ones here, I'm going to abbreviate them, but we'll write them out later. This is called your medial geniculate nucleus, okay? This one here, since it's a little bit more lateral, this is called your lateral geniculate nucleus, okay? So, <clears throat> the pulvinar nucleus is a type of sensory nucleus of the thalamus, lateral geniculate is a sensory nucleus of the thalamus, and the medial geniculate nucleus is a sensory nucleus of the thalamus. So how many of these nuclei do we have to talk about? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, let's first start off here with the lateral geniculate nucleus. Okay, so the first one we're going to discuss here is the lateral geniculate nucleus. Basic thing I want you to remember. I don't want you to have to remember tons because there's already so much information that you guys are having to absorb right now. Basic thing I want you to take away from this lateral geniculate nucleus is it involved in the visual pathway. Okay so this is involved in vision. That's it. I don't want you to have to remember too much. So lateral geniculate nu nucleus visual pathway. Okay how does this all work? Okay Oh, and another way to remember this, this is how I, I tend to remember this, because sometimes people get confused with the medial and the lateral. How do you remember? I remember L, you can remember light. So light kind of helps you to kind of idea, uh, remember the idea that that's kind of responsible for vision. So that's kind of a little trick that I help to remember the difference between the lateral geniculate and the medial geniculate nucleus. So remember, lateral, light, vision. Okay. So you have some type of visual stimulus. That visual stimulus, what does it do? Well, it actually is going to hit our retina. When it hits the retina, the retina will then become activated and send impulses down the optic nerve. From the optic nerve, it'll actually branch, it'll actually bifurcate. There's different types of fibers, media and lateral fibers. But eventually, they'll move through the optic tract and go to this nucleus here, hanging off the side of the thalamus. What is this nucleus here called? This is called your lateral geniculate nucleus. It receives this information, and some of it can send into the midbrain. But the other thing it's going to do is it's going to take this visual stimulus and send this to a particular area in the occipital lobe. You know what this area of the occipital lobe is called? This here is called your primary visual cortex. So this is called your primary visual cortex. What is this called? 
primary visual cortex, sometimes referred to as Brodmann Area 17. If you really want to, I'll put down number 17. But what do I want you to really honestly take away from this? Lateral geniculate nucleus is responsible for taking information with respect to the visual pathway and sending it to the primary visual cortex so that we can send that and have perception of the visual stimulus. Done. Let's move on to the next nucleus. And the next nucleus that I want to talk about here is the medial geniculate nucleus. So this is called the medial geniculate nucleus. Now the medial geniculate nucleus, this is involved in the auditory pathway. So this is involved in the auditory pathway or hearing. Okay. How do I remember this? M music. So you can also remember the M here is music and that music is kind of tied to hearing. So whenever you remember lateral geniculate, L, light, medial geniculate, M, music, kind of helps you to differentiate that. So the medial geniculate nucleus, if you guys remember, we talked about, honestly, some of this stuff should actually click because we already talked about a lot of this stuff in the visual pathway, the auditory pathway. What happens here is you have that nerve. What is that nerve that picks up that sensory information from the inner ear? That's your vestibulocochlear nerve, particularly the cochlear division. Takes that information via cranial nerve eight and synapses where? Synapses on the cochlear nuclei present in the pons medulla junction. From these cochlear nuclei, what do they do? They send these fibers that cross upwards, right? And what does this thing, what does this whole kind of crossing structure form? It can form what's called the trapezoid body. We talked about that in the anatomy of the medulla. Some of these uh, structures will actually give off fibers to what's called the superior olives. But the basic concept here is that after this trapezoid bo body is formed, it then ascends upwards. What is the name of this track that ascends upwards after crossing? This is called your, what is this? Lateral lemniscus. Now the lateral lemniscus, what will eventually do? It'll synapse on this structure here located in the midbrain. And this structure here located in the midbrain is actually called the inferior colliculus. What is this called here? This is called your inferior colliculus, both of these, they're paired. The inferior colliculus will receive the sensory information of auditory stimulus, and then via the brachium of the inferior colliculus will synapse on these little bodies here coming off the thalamus. What are these little structures here called? This is called your medial geniculate nucleus. The medial geniculate nucleus will then send its radiations here to what area? The temporal lobe. The primary auditory cortex. Ooh, mama. That should make sense. So the medial geniculate nucleus sends its information to the primary auditory cortex for us to be able to perceive the things that we are hearing. So the primary auditory cortex, you guys remember there's what's called that transverse gyrus of Heschel we talked about there. If you guys really wanna know the Brabant area here is also known as 41, 42. Okay, but again, I want you to primarily know the primary auditory cortex. All right, so we talked about the lateral geniculate nucleus. We talked about the medial geniculate nucleus. Lateral, light, that's vision. Medial, music, ears, that's for hearing. The pulvinar nucleus is actually really interesting um, and again, remember where that, that structure is. That pulvinar nucleus kind of makes up that entire dorsal aspect of the lateral nuclear group. The pulvinar nucleus is really cool. So here's our pulvinar nucleus. Let's draw this one here. We're going to shade this in here in blue, right? It receives information from this nucleus. What is this nucleus here? This is the medial side. This is the lateral side. This is anterior of the thalamus. This is posterior of the thalamus. So this is our medial geniculate nucleus. This is on the lateral side. So this is our lateral geniculate nucleus. The medial geniculate nucleus, which is taking auditory information, it sends that information to the, what structure here? To the pulvinar nucleus. The lateral geniculate nucleus, it sends its information, what kind of things? Visual information to the pulvinar nucleus. There's two other structures. You know down here at the level, this is our midbrain. All right, so this is our midbrain. Obviously, this is our pons, and this is the medulla. So, 
in the back of the midbrain, you have these two structures here. This is called the superior colliculus, and this is called the inferior colliculus. The superior colliculus and the inferior colliculus both send information to the pulvinar nucleus. So there's three, or actually technically four inputs to the pulvinar nucleus. The medial geniculate nucleus, four, auditory pathway, lateral geniculate nucleus, four, visual pathway, and superior colliculus is involved with reflexive movements of the head from a visual stimulus. Inferior colliculus is reflexive movement of the head with response to a auditory stimulus. So this sucker is receiving both auditory and visual stimuli. And guess what it does? It takes that information from the pulvinar nucleus and sends it to two areas in the occipital lobe. We already talked about one of them, the primary visual cortex, that's this one here. And if you guys really remember the numbers, it goes 17, 18, 19, right? So primary visual is 17, 18 is your association. Well, actually 18 and 19 are both a part of your visual association area. So what I want you to remember is primarily 18 and 19, which are your visual association area, are receiving information from the pulvinar nucleus. Now, the pulvinar nucleus is receiving all this auditory and visual information. Guess what it's particularly involved in? It's involved in what's called visual processing. Now, that might seem just like very vague. Let me explain what I mean. The visual association area takes particular past experiences with a visual stimuli, maybe someone's face. So they, they have your past experiences of someone's face or maybe even a flower. And it helps with recognition. It gives meaning to that image. So it helps us to recognize and perceive particularly the meaning behind the color, the movement, the different types of facial expressions. So that is important. So it helps us to be able to see someone's face, recognize that we've seen that, pa that face in the past, and give meaning to it. That is the job of that visual association area. And who is it receiving its information from? The pulvinar nucleus. Boom. Let's move on. All right, so now let's talk about the next nucleus here. This was in that ventral component, right? The ventral component of the, uh, the lateral nuclear group. This is called, we're going to cover the ventro posterior, posterior lateral, this is one heck of a name, uh, nucleus. You see why they just write it as VPL now. Um, so the ventral posterior lateral nucleus, let's take a look here. So if we take a look at this structure here, this thalamus, this is the lateral sides over here. The nucleus is going to be right here. So we're just going to kind of shade one in here. This is going to be our ventral posterior lateral nucleus. All right. The ventral posterior lateral nucleus, I want you to remember that it receives sensory information. But sensory information from what? You guys know this stuff already. So it's going to be a very quick recap. It is from our dorsal column medial limeniscus pathway. What is that pathway responsible for? I know you guys know it. This is involved with proprioception. It's involved in fine and discriminative touch. It's involved in vibration sense. All of that stuff is getting sent up to this nucleus. The other one, and I know you know this one, is called your spinal, spinal, thalamic tract. And I know that you know that there's two parts to this one, the anterior portion and the lateral portion. You guys know that the lateral portion is involved in pain and temperature. The anterior portion is involved in crude touch and pressure. What I want you to remember, and we're not going to go into crazy detail, but this structure, these nuclei are receiving information. So if we kind of recap it, what is it receiving? Let's put over here pain, temperature, crude, touch, and pressure. All of this stuff is going to be going via your spinothalamic tract. And what that does is it sends information to the posterior gray horn, crosses over. If it's the pain and temperature, it goes up lateral. If it's the crew touch and pressure, it goes to the ventral, but then eventually ascends and they both fuse together and eventually terminate on that ventral posterior lateral nucleus. And the same concept here, you're also going to have, what else? Fine touch, and I'm not going to write it out, but discriminative touch, uh, proprioception, 
and vibration sense. All of that stuff is going to get picked up and carried via what pathway? The dorsal column medial meniscus pathway. That'll move into the posterior gray horn, move into your what structure here? And move into your dorsal white column, ascend upwards to the medulla, synapse on the different types of nucleus gracilis, nucleus fasciculus, I mean, uh, nucleus cuneatus, nucleus gracilis, and we know here that they cross and ascend upwards and then terminate on the ventral posterior lateral nucleus. Where does the ventral posterior lateral nucleus send that information? To the cerebral cortex. But you know what areas of the cerebral cortex? Because we're ninja nerds. We got to know all that stuff, right? It sends it to your primary somatosensory cortex. What cortex? Your primary somatosensory. Man, this is so much writing. Sensory cortex. What Broadman area is this? 312. So 312 is your Broadman areas for this one as well. So that's what I want you to know for the ventral posterior lateral nucleus. Boom. Let's move on to the next one. All right, so the last sensory thalamic nucleus, thank the Lord. Um, this is going to be the ventral posterior medial nucleus. What is this called? The ventro posterior medial nucleus. Oh. Again, you understand why they just put like, you know, v VPM. <laughs> All right, so the ventral posterior medial nucleus. Now, we have to kind of, again, understand that orientation. You guys remember, these are the lateral sides of the thalamus, and this is our whole lateral nuclear group, right? The ventral posterior lateral nucleus will be over here, right? We already talked about that one. Let's just say here, we're going to do this one here in this kind of dark green here. This structure here, the ventral posterior medial nucleus, it should be more medial in respect to the ventral posterior lateral nucleus. Now, there's two primary sensations that the ventral posterior medial nucleus receives. One, it receives information via what's called the trigeminothalamic tract. Do you guys remember what the trigeminothalamic tract picks up? It picks up all the different types of sensations from the face. Right? So it picks up pain, temperature, proprioception, vibration sense, all of that stuff. It's picking up that sensations from the face. The other type of sensation that we're picking up is we're picking up gustation. Gustation is your taste sense. And that taste sense is actually being sent via multiple, you know, there's different cranial nerves. You have your facial nerve and your glossopharyngeal nerve and your vagus nerve. They're picking up all the different types of taste sensations from your gustatory receptors and sending that to a particular nucleus called the nucleus of tractus solitarius. So two types of sensations, taste and pain, temperature, proprioception, all the different types of sensations of the face. Again, we've already covered all of this stuff in crazy detail, but all of these facial sensations, all of them, are carried via the trigeminal nerve. Now, the trigeminal nerve has its fibers here, right? And what it does is it kind of gives off what's called the trigeminal tract. And these trigeminal tract fibers can, once this is your, this is your sensory fiber, right? So this is the sensory component of the trigeminal nerve. It's sending information to the central nervous system, in this case, the brainstem. That sensory information will then move into the different types of nuclei here, the cranial nerve nuclei of five particularly, right? So this is your mesencephalic, your principal pontine, and your spinal nucleus of the trigeminal nerve. As it ends and terminates on these nuclei, these nuclei give off their efferents. And these efferents travel upwards and synapse on what structure? the ventral posterior medial nucleus. So again, you have the facial sensations traveling via the trigeminal tracts to the trigeminal nuclei, and then upwards via the trigeminothalamic tract to the ventral posterior medial nucleus. Boom. So all your taste sensations, right? So you know the taste sensations, that's being carried by what different cranial nerves? Cranial nerve, seven, right? That's the anterior two, uh, two thirds of the tongue. Cranial nerve, nine. That's your glossopharyngeal, that's the posterior one third of the tongue. And even a little bit from the vagus nerve, from the epiglottic voleculae, and even a little bit of the posterior oral pharynx. All of that information is being sent via these cranial nerves and terminating on a particular nucleus here 
called the nucleus of Tractus Solitarius. Then from this nucleus of Tractus Solitarius, it can send fibers upwards. We don't really need to know, but it's called the central tegmental tract. And that central tegmental, here I'll just put it, central tegmental tract, it'll ascend upwards from the nucleus of Tractus Solitarius and synapse on that ventral posterior medial nucleus. Then where will the things from the ventral posterior medial nucleus go? To all the different areas of the cerebral cortex. In this case, it may go to the primary somatosensory cortex. Primary somato sensory cortex. And again, what is that Brabin area just for the heck of it? Three, one, and two. All right, thank the Lord we're at the last motor, uh, we're at the last nuclei of the thalamus. Okay, so the motor thalamic nuclei, let's talk about these. So we've already talked about the limbic, the sensory, let's take it home, let's finish it, we're so close, guys. All right, quick recap with all of these nuclei. We already talked about this, anterior, posterior, lateral, medial, right? This was our anterior thalamic nuclei. This was our mediodorsal nucleus, our dorsal medial nucleus. This here was our pulvinar nucleus. This was our medial geniculate nucleus. This was our lateral geniculate nucleus. So now we also have to talk about these other ones. We kind of highlighted them, but we haven't discussed them. The ventral anterior and the ventral lateral nucleus. But we did discuss the ventral posterior lateral nucleus and the ventral posterior medial nucleus. And we also talked about the intralaminar nuclei with the paraphysicular, the central median, but we've primarily focused on that central median nucleus, right? So we've talked about a ton of different nuclei. Let's finish it, let's take it home and finish up talking about the ventral lateral and the ventral anterior nuclei. These are our motor nuclei. All right, so let's first discuss, discuss the ventral anterior nucleus. All right, sweet. So this is a motor nucleus. So here we have to kind of, again, show it here. So this is our, we're only showing one thalamus just for the sake of the diagram here. So again, this is anterior, posterior, medial, lateral. This is a part of the lateral nuclear group and it's gonna be the most anterior portion in that lateral nuclear group. So there's our ventral anterior nucleus. The ventral anterior nucleus receives input from one particular structure, the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia is something that we have to kind of dig in in its own video. It's way too much to discuss here. We're going to cover the literally the basic concept here. What I want you to know with the ventral anterior nucleus is that it receives information from the basal ganglia and sends that up to the cerebral cortex. The whole purpose, the whole reason for that is it plays a role within the initiation. So the initiation and a very important thing and planning of movement. That is very, very key. That's what I want you to take home with this. So again, input is from basal ganglia, output is to the cerebral cortex, particularly the premotor cortex, we'll talk about that in a second, and its primary function is for initiation of movement and planning of the motor movement. All right, so let's talk about this basic. Basic, basic, basic. Here we have our cortex, right? Okay, here's our cerebral cortex, and there's different areas, premotor, primary motor, the somatosensory area, all of those different areas, they send their motor plan. So our, they're basically your motor plan is, if I wanna flex my, uh, my bicep, right? I have a particular motor plan that my primary motor cortex has a plan for, okay? What the primary motor cortex and premotor cortex and all those areas do is they send that motor plan down to the basal ganglia. And when it does that, it can synapse on different neurons in the basal ganglia, like maybe the putamen or the putamen. And that structure will then synapse on things like the globus pilitis internus, and then from the globus pilitis internus, it may go and synapse on the thalamus. And what happens during that pathway is that there's different types of neurotransmitters that are released and the whole purpose is once this motor plan comes down to the basal ganglia, the basal ganglia sift through all that motor plan information, motor plan information, and send that information to the thalamus and from the thalamus back to the cortex via this pathway. This pathway here, this one that we talked about here, and the most basic concept is called our direct pathway. 
And the direct pathway is designed to pay, basically amplify your motor movements, okay? So and help to amplify what we already have planned. Another thing that can happen is, is that these cortical fibers coming down to the, uh, your basal ganglia can also, again, synapse on neurons within the putamen, and that can go to your globus pilitis externus. From the globus pilitis externus, it can go to the subthalamus. From the subthalamus, it can go back to the globus pilitis internus, and then to the ventral anterior nucleus of the thalamus and back up to the cerebral cortex. This pathway, the other pathway, is called the indirect pathway. And the indirect pathway is designed to pretty much kind of like slow down, dampen the already planned motor movements. The last thing that can happen here is you have this structure here called the substantia nigra, and it has a lot of dopaminergic neurons that can come over here and basically help to excite or amplify both the direct pathway and indirect pathway, okay? The whole thing I want you to remember from this is that you have a motor plan coming from your cortex to the basal ganglia, they sift through it via the direct, indirect, modify it in a particular way, send it back to the thalamus, and the thalamus sends it back to the cerebral cortex. Now, we have the perfect motor movement that we have planned and that we can initiate. Now, what is this area of the cerebral cortex that we primarily send these thalamocortical fibers to? That's important to remember. This is called the pre-motor cortex. And if you really want to remember, this is Brodmann area number six. All right, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So ventral anterior nucleus receives input from basal ganglia, sends it to the premotor cortex involved in initiation and planning of proper motor movement. Let's move on to the next and last nucleus. Thank the Lord. This last nucleus here is called the ventral lateral nucleus. What is this one called? The ventral lateral nucleus of the thalamus. Okay, so again, we already talked about this before. Let's do this in pink, what we had before. Here's anterior, posterior, lateral, medial, right? Here we had the ventral anterior nucleus. So behind it, just posterior to it, and a little bit lateral, you're going to have the ventral lateral nucleus. So we have our ventral anterior and ventral lateral nucleus. Now, the ventral lateral nucleus has primarily two types of functions. One is it plays a role in coordination. So it plays a role in coordination of motor movement. So coordination of motor movement and modulation, modulation of motor movement, particularly again, going back to the kind of uh, planning and initiating aspect of it, okay? So how does that all kind of factor in? So again, basic takeaway is that the ventral lateral nucleus is involved in coordination and modulation of motor movement. There's two inputs to the ventral lateral nucleus, the basal ganglia, which we already talked about. So basically, we're not gonna go through all the direct and indirect, but basically information from the motor cortex comes down to the basal ganglia and sends that information to the ventral lateral nucleus. All the things that we need to kind of help to modulate our motor movements, right? So dampen it or amplify it. That's the basic concept. We already talked about it above. And then from that, that ventral lateral nucleus will take all of those different modifications coming from the basal ganglia and send that back up to the motor cortex. You know what else is happening? Here's what's really cool. Not only is this motor plan going to the basal ganglia to let the basal, gang basal ganglia modify it, but guess what else it's doing? This son of a gun is smart. It also sends information about a motor plan down to the cerebellum. The cerebellum is involved in coordination of movement. It's involved in tone. It's involved in posture. Guess what the cerebellum is also receiving things from? You know it's receiving information about proprioception. What is proprioception? 
It's the position of your muscles, your tendons, your joints, your ligaments, all in a three-dimensional space. It's receiving all of that information so it knows where our muscles, our tendons, our joints are in a three-dimensional space. Then it receives information from the cerebral cortex about the planned motor movement. It also receives information from the inner ear. You know from our vestibule, there's also information that can be sent in to the cerebellum about the inner ear. So it receives information based upon our equilibrium. So it's receiving information about equilibrium, it's receiving information about all the different types of sensations in our three-dimensional space, and it receives a pre-planned motor plan, a pre, uh, kind of a de pre-designed motor idea. It takes all the information about the position of muscles, tendons, joints, takes all the information about our inner ear equilibrium and the motor plan and comes up with just the perfect blueprint for the best type of movement necessary. And then guess what it does? Once it's kind of taken all this information that we've received, it comes up with the perfect blueprint and sends this information up to the ventral lateral nucleus. You know what else it can also do though? It can go straight to the ventral lateral nucleus or it can also give fibers that go to the red nucleus. And then the red nucleus can send some of that information up to the ventral lateral nucleus. You know the specific nucleus that actually is kind of in within the cerebellum that's kind of pretty much sending this information to the thalamus? You know what that nucleus is called? It's called your dentate nucleus. So it's one of those deep cerebellar nuclei. It's receiving information for the motor plan, receiving proprioception, equilibrium, sifts through it, sends the proper motor plan either straight to the ventral lateral nucleus or to the red nucleus, then to the ventral lateral nucleus. Then that ventral lateral nucleus sends that information up to the cortex. What area of the cortex do you say? The primary motor cortex. And this primary motor cortex is also known as Brodmann area number four. So it's the primary motor cortex or Brodmann area number four. So that's the cool thing about the ventral lateral nucleus. It's receiving information about modulation of the motor plan from the basal ganglia and motor information from the cerebellum about the proper coordination of movement and sends it back to the cortex. So beautiful. All right, engineers, this was a mammoth of a topic, and I hope it all made sense in this video where we covered all the different thalamic nuclei, all their different connections and functions. If it did make sense and you guys did like it, please smash that like button, comment down in the comment section, and please subscribe. Also, down in the description box, we'll have links to our Facebook, our Instagram, Patreon, all of those things. Go check it out. Again, once again, big shout out to AIM. He's the one who basically suggested that we do this video. He's also one of our master ninja nerd members. If you guys want to also request some videos, have some other different types of perks that we have on our YouTube page, go check out, join the subscription, and you guys can also request a video for us to make for you guys. All right, engineers, as always, we love you, we thank you, and until next time.